everybody, and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. Now, one of the things that we all sort of know is coming with the upcoming Wheel of Time television adaptation is changes from the book. It's inevitable that some elements won't transfer well from the book to the screen, so the adaptation is going to be forced to make alterations to storylines, characters, and settings in order to give us a cohesive and realistic show. Up to this point, we really don't have many of the actual changes that they'll be making, so we've been speculating based on bits and pieces of information that we've received. In today's video, I'm going to be giving you my opinion on three things that I would change in adapting the series for television. I've already got another one of these planned to come out here in the not-so-distant future, so I'll have three more changes coming out with that video. Let me quickly mention a brand new sponsor to the channel that I've been campaigning for for quite a while to get just because it's a service I use, and I think it's one everyone should have. Keep watching, and I'll tell you not only what they do, but I'll give you a cool offer that they're going to be giving to my viewers and a way that you can help support the channel and get a very necessary and really cool service at the same time. So let's go ahead and take a look at three changes that I'd like to see in the Wheel of Time television adaptation. First, let's throw up a spoiler warning. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers running all the way through A Memory of Light. If you haven't finished all of the books yet, please watch this video at your own risk. You are going to be spoiled on major events that happen throughout the books, you have been warned. So in making my list, I've decided to focus on the series as a whole and operate under the assumption that we'll make it all the way to the end. So I'll be making some suggestions that fall outside the scope of the first season of the show and some things that I think would increase the watchability of the show for the masses. To be very clear here, the suggestions that I'm going to make are what I think will bring non-fantasy fans to the fan base. I told this story a couple weeks back on the Dusty Wheel, but it's certainly pertinent to this discussion. Game of Thrones started as a gamble for HBO. No one had done a gritty fantasy adaptation before that was targeted towards mainstream Americans rather than hardcore fantasy fans. They were incredibly successful at bringing in non-fantasy fans and this is the reason that Game of Thrones is one of the most popular television series of all time. Now, obviously, Game of Thrones and Wheel of Time are very different stories. But there are reasons for the success of Game of Thrones that Wheel of Time showrunners would be dumb to ignore. Here in Columbus, I often listen to local sports talk radio when I'm driving. During most of the run for Game of Thrones, one of the local sports talk shows would regularly spend 30 minutes each week doing recaps of Game of Thrones and giving their opinions on the story. These are former NFL football players, and not only were they completely engaged in the show, but they believed that all of their fans all over the city were as well. That's how mainstream Game of Thrones became. So when I make suggestions here, this is not meant to cater to only fantasy fans, but some changes that I believe can help appeal to everyone, because I think that's what's going to get us a complete story and not a cancellation after three or four seasons. So let's hit the first change that I'd like to see, and this is the only change that's going to fall within the scope of the first season, and it's probably the least controversial change on my list. That comes with the ending of the Eye of the World. In the books, Rand and the party face off against Agenor and Balthamel right outside the doorway to the Eye of the World. Moraine briefly tries to fight them, Balthamel is killed by the Green Man, and Agenor chases Rand before drawing too much of the One Power from the Eye of the World, and then killing himself. Then Rand skims off without knowing what he's doing and ends up fighting a battle at Tarwin's Gap with the One Power, and then meeting Ishamael in the World of Dreams, who he believes is the Dark One at this point and then he stabs him with like a flaming sword, and then he thinks he killed him. I have a video that pretty much breaks down in detail all of the events of the end of the book uh, of Eye of the World, and if you're one of those people that was super confused as to what was going on, I highly recommend watching that video because that's what I address there. I will have that video linked in the description of this video if you want to watch that afterwards. So I know this part is confusing to many people, and when they, especially when they read it the first time, and that's because we really only see these events through Rand's point of view and he really doesn't even understand what's going on. Later, we sort of discover what happened, but it was never really very clear. The change I would like to see here stems from really simplifying the events that go on here and making it clear not only what's going on, but giving it more of a purpose. So this change takes the form of two different things. First, the Eye of the World itself, meaning the pool of untainted Sidene. This needs a very defined purpose that makes sense within the scope of the story. We need to at least have a moderately good explanation of why it was made, why it's important as a plot device, and why it's important to both our protagonists as well as the focus for the Forsaken and the Shadow. In the books, it's sort of vague and maybe not explained very well why it's even there. So, as an idea, perhaps it could be clearly defined that the Eye of the World was made by Aes Sedai at great sacrifice to be pure so that it would allow the boar to be sealed completely without decay as the current seals were failing due to the taint. 
The Shadow knew of the danger of this, and they not only wanted to stop them from reaching it, but maybe they wanted to use it for their own purposes. Again, whatever the change that they want to make here, or whatever the clarification that they want to make here, the main thing is, is that the Eye of the World needs to have a distinct purpose that makes sense to the viewer and has weight behind it. There needs to be real danger for the world and for our characters for not reaching it. The second part of how I believe the ending of the Eye of the World needs to change is that I don't want Rand to stab a Shamael or even get into a sword battle with him. I like the idea of Rand meeting him again in the World of Dreams, and I'd love for Rand to actually realize that he is not the Dark One. And that confrontation doesn't end with Rand believing that he killed the Dark One. Primarily the reason for this is the next two books end with Ram stabbing Ishamayel. And I don't want him killed here in this book, so I don't, I, I felt like that was so repetitive and I don't want that to creep into the, the television part of the story. I think it would be cool if there was some interaction between the two of them, but it sets up this idea that Ishamayel was really just Ishamayel and not the Dark One, not Baal Zaman. And so Rand now understands that this is a much bigger fight of what was going on. And that would be a reveal to the rest of the viewers as to who this was. Because we may have been led as viewers to believe that Ishamayel was Baal Zaman the whole time. Overall, I just think making the happenings of the Eye of the World more clear and giving them more purpose is going to add quite a bit to the television show. The second change that I would make may be a bit more controversial than the first, but nevertheless, I think it's necessary and would add quite a bit more to the story than it takes away. One of the things that makes villains good villains is that they're a danger to our protagonists and they actually do harm and can harm them. If we feel like everyone is 100% safe all the time, then there's no actual tension. Pot on Fane has a fairly gruesome storyline throughout The Great Hunt, and he does some pretty awful things like nailing people to doors and cutting up Murdral and all kinds of things. But he doesn't do much to really hurt our protagonists other than stealing the dagger from Matt. Here's the change I want to see. During the events of the Shadow Rising, when Pot on Fane has entered the Two Rivers with the White Cloaks, he leads a group that kills Perrin's family off screen. I think this brings out some very serious character moments for Perrin and Fael, so I absolutely want to keep this. But the first of the changes that I'd make here is that I want that to be on screen and I want it to be awful. Hopefully, if they do it right, we've met these characters before and we know Perrin's family to a degree that we really don't in the books. If we see characters that we like that are connected to one of our main characters or the people that we're following be brutally killed, that's going to add a lot of weight to Pot on Fane's character. But I wouldn't stop there. Here's the even more controversial part. I want Pot on Fane to very brutally murder one of the popular Emmons fielders. Primarily, I think Bran Alvear would be a good choice, possibly Haro Luhan, or both. So I know these are fairly beloved characters, so why would I want to watch this? Well, I don't really want to watch people die, but it adds to the stakes of the events in the story. If we know that characters like Egwene's father can die, who's to say that Tam can't die? or Fael, or anybody else that we care about. This is what emotionally invests us in the story. The other advantage here is that neither of these characters really does much past this book, so there isn't much lost by having them killed off. It will make Perrin and the Two Rivers people's final battle or final victory over the Trollocs and driving the White Cloaks out all that much more, more cathartic for us. Additionally, this can give some nuance to some of the other White Cloaks that we might follow, like Dane Bornholt, as he feels the guilt and the weight of what Pot on Fane as Ordeeth does in the name of the Children of the Light. Now, this can be a part of his arc as turning around uh, from his fanaticism. Obviously, it's not like this happens and then all of a sudden he's a good guy, but at least this is maybe the seeds of him becoming disillusioned or disgusted or carrying guilt with what they've done. Now, let me take this moment to introduce the channel's new sponsor, NordVPN. I've been a major advocate of VPN use for a long time, and I'm super excited to finally be able to work with NordVPN. For those of you who aren't familiar with what a VPN does, basically it protects your privacy online. Did you know that if you have an internet provider and you live in the US or Europe, they track everything that you search, everywhere you go in your browser, everything you look at, and your wireless providers not only track all the same things, but also your location. You're targeted for malware, ads, and your security is at risk. If you use public Wi-Fi, you could have your password stolen, your banking information stolen. All of these things are possible for a hacker to do with public Wi-Fi or if they had your Wi-Fi password. Additionally, many countries limit what you can watch on Netflix or Amazon. So for instance, based on where you live, if you live in the EU and you want to watch something that's on American Netflix, you are SOL, my friend. That is, unless you have a VPN. 
A VPN makes all of your browsing completely private with no logging. Your internet provider cannot track you, that you can choose what country you want to appear to log in from, and most importantly, you are protecting your privacy. So why Nord? Well, they're based in Panama, so they have no laws about mandatory logging. So if you were online browsing something scandalous, like pictures of well-turned calves, then you are free from anyone, including your internet provider, knowing about it. You can use Nord on up to six devices, including your mobile devices, and it's just a one-touch login that's super easy to use. It's also super fast, unlike some other VPNs which really slow down your browsing speed. Nord is just as fast as my normal provider. I've been a customer of theirs for a long time, and I highly recommend using them. That's why I'm so excited to finally have them as a sponsor. If you sign up for their service using my link, you'll support the channel, which is awesome, but you'll also protect yourself quite a bit, especially if you travel, and again, if you're using public Wi-Fi or even your work Wi-Fi. Your information can easily be stolen if you don't have the protection of a VPN. So absolutely click the link and get signed up. The link is in the description of this video. Additionally, because you're one of my viewers, you're gonna get 70% off their most popular plan for, for having it for three years for really one really low price. So go sign up. Back to the video. The third change I'd like to see is in reference to the Forsaken. I'd like to see the Forsaken have expanded roles from the books. Now I know many of you are gonna say, Nablus, they have to cut things. There is no way they're gonna be able to expand things. And I hear this argument, and it's pretty certainly true that things are going to need to be cut throughout the story. We just talked about that. There's lots of changes that need made. I've also heard plenty of people, including Daniel Green, advocating to trim the number of Forsaken to down to as few as five or seven and put a heavier focus on them. I absolutely agree with the heavier focus, and I think that some of them should have more of a focus than others. But I want to keep the same number, and I want to get more of their story, motivations, and really see them at work. I want to humanize them and make them more competent at being evil. Uh, and give each one individual arcs that go across the story. Or how in the world would they do this? Well, to start, keep in mind that the number of threads that are going in an epic fantasy TV series are massive. You can have an arc of characters where a certain character might only get two or three minutes of screen time in an episode, but we're still following their story and they have an arc. Months ago, I broke down Game of Thrones in order to see how long individual scenes lasted and how many cuts they made per episode. The average length of a scene was less than two minutes, and they were able to follow up to 12 plot lines or character arcs in a single episode sometimes by just jumping around. Do we really need to follow all of the Forsaken from the very beginning? Absolutely not. But what does need to be avoided is like a villain of the season trope, where we have one major Forsaken as the villain, and that's all we hear about, and then they're killed, and then we move on to the next one. We need to follow what they're doing, see them in action, even if it's just in very small doses, but I want to become invested in them as well. Maybe even set some of them up as anti-heroes that ultimately prove themselves to be just as evil as we thought they were. One that comes to mind here is Demondred. He's kept mostly a mystery in the books. We don't find out that he's been in Shara until the big surprise in the last battle. And I think this worked out for the most part in the books, but I'm not sure that it will in the show. Not to mention, if you've ever heard Brandon Sanderson talk about the narrative that he would have loved to have explored in Shara with Demondred, being their savior and breaking the chains of slavery only to lead them into the last battle to fight for the Dark One, there's a very compelling story there that I would have loved to have seen fleshed out. The show offers the chance to explore that little by little so that we can almost empathize with Demondred before he reaffirms how evil he is. Brandon talks about how Demondred could have been the greatest person of the age and could have saved the forces of the light, but ultimately he just couldn't be that person because he couldn't get past his hatred and jealousy of Luz Theron Telemann. It's why instead of being praised and celebrated, he ends up losing and being killed. Seeing Demondred lead a slave uprising and seeing him humanized in different parts of the world would be way more interesting in the show than him leading a surprise attack with an army that we hadn't even seen before, just because the Shadow needed human channelers to even have a chance. Now, this doesn't need to stop with Demondred. How many of you want to see more Grendel? Duh. I want to see more Samuraj with Shanchan. I want to see how evil she is. I want to see more of Masana in the tower. I want more of Lanfear doing her thing and being crazy. I want all of these villains to be compelling. And it won't take much to give them more substance. We can be following two and three and four of them a season and just kind of seeing the pieces in place. And of course, this, like I said, it doesn't need to all be done in the same season. We can absolutely be following multiple at a time and setting up conflicts that are one and two seasons ahead of the current events of the story. So what do you all think of my changes? Do you agree with these? Please let me know what you think in the comments below. I have another three set to come out here very shortly, and I know you're going to find those ones super controversial.
As always, check out the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. It really is the best way to support the channel. I love my patrons. I've uh, been corresponding quite a bit. We just did our monthly advisory council meeting last week where I kind of get together with my top tier patrons and we kind of lay out the, the plan for the next month and get some feedback. If you want to be a part of that, check out the Patreon. Also, check out the NordVPN in the description below the link there. Get yourself protected. At least learn why it's important to have a VPN if you don't know much about them. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel as well. Click the bell icon to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. Also, drop a comment. It helps with the metrics. Thanks to all of you for watching. And until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. My mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free. Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?